It used to be extremely difficult for me to sleep until I hit about 30, 31 years old. Yeah. And I would sit in bed for probably an hour to an hour and a half almost every night. Uh -huh anxious, mm. worrying, thinking, yeah. judging myself, yeah. whatever it may be, stressing about something I haven't done yet or really just kind of beating myself up yeah. emotionally. And what I've learned, there's two things that I've learned, well, really three things that I've learned that have helped me go to sleep extremely fast Ooh. in yeah. the last eight years. Okay. That has been like an automatic switch for me. Uh -huh. One is going through a transition of fully sharing and starting to heal the process of my shame from the mm, past. Mm, so talk like yeah. finding a therapist and talking about what I'm shame, shameful about, yeah. um, you know, and really revealing the parts of myself that I never wanted anyone to know about yeah. me. Yeah. There were so many things that I didn't like about myself that I was mm -hmm. ashamed of or felt insecure around. Mm -hmm. And it made me feel like a prisoner yeah. to my own thoughts uh -huh. because yeah. I felt like I was, in a sense, hiding myself yeah. to the world yeah. and to the people closest to me. Uh -huh. Like certain people didn't even know who I was. Yeah. So I felt like an imposter at mm -hmm. times. Mm -hmm. I was yeah. still a loving, fun, generous human, but yes. I felt like there was a few things that people didn't know about me. Yeah. And when I started to open up about those things, uh -huh. I felt inner peace. Yeah. It, it didn't oh, all go beautiful. away, but I felt like you know yeah. a lot more peace. Number two was I started to focus on everything at night, what I was grateful for from the day. Mm -hmm. I was like, okay, if there was anything good today, what was it? Even yeah. if it was all bad, uh -huh. there had to be something. I'm alive, yeah. you, know, I, yeah. I, you know, I'm healthy or uh -huh. whatever it may be, I have a roof. Yeah. So it's just focusing on anything and I, and I do that every night where I think mm. it's about three things to be grateful for. Mm. That brings me like another level of peace. Yeah. And then I think about what am I gonna do tomorrow to help people? Mm. How am oh, I gonna that's serve? Beautiful. Yeah. So it's like, you know, healing the shame, yeah. focusing on gratitude and then thinking about how am I gonna serve? Yeah. Not just what do I need for me, but how can I show up for other people? Mm. That kind of three-part combination gives me so much peace before I go to bed. Oh, that's so beautiful. And it's a practice, you know, yeah. it's like a constant yeah. practice. It's yes. not always perfect, but yeah. it's a practice, yeah. Yeah. I love the um, um, thinking about something you're going to do for somebody else tomorrow, mm -hmm. coming from this practice of healing your own shame. One of the superpowers in good anxiety that comes from your own anxiety, and this is a beautiful example yes. that you just told me, is the superpower of empathy. So For yourself or others? Uh, for First, for yourself and recognizing it in yourself and then giving it out to others. Uh -huh. Because just as you described your journey, a lot of our own anxieties have been with us since we were little. Right. Same anxiety. They stay over, for they decades. Stay for, for your lifetime sometimes. What was yours? Um, so uh, I, I have many, but the one that I talk <laughs> about here is... Um, shyness and, and kind of social mm. anxiety. And um, I've learned because I'm a teacher and yes. because I want to become an author, I've learned the skills not to have those kinds of anxieties. But I was painfully shy as a young girl. And even into college, I I found myself in social situations and wanting to join and not, not you know, feeling comfortable or even in class. And um, so I realized that that has become my superpower as a teacher because I know when I'm standing at the front of the shyness classroom. Shyness is a superpower. My shyness. Really? Why is that? Because when I'm standing at the front of the classroom, there are always those students that say, oh, I know the answer, I know the answer. And I know that there's many more that mm. want to talk to me, that want to show me what they know, want to have that interaction, but can't do that. And so what do I do? I make sure that I am there 15 minutes before I stand there, mm. I talk to the students before, I stay after class. Anybody that wants to come up for a casual conversation where you don't have to be the one raising your hand. And I didn't even realize it until I wrote this book mm. that that is a superpower yeah. of in-class empathy. And I have that particular form of empathy because of my particular form of anxiety, my social anxiety. And so imagine the 90% of people that have their particular form of anxiety. They know what it feels like. They know what's going through many of others mm -hmm. of our minds. And what if you turn that around and you do what you do and say, how can, right. I, how can I help somebody else in this way that I know I've struggled but I also know what can help. Sure, right? sure. Okay. So that's how, one of my favorite superpowers. How do we know how to turn anxiety into something good? Like yeah. if 90% of the, is this the US or the world feels anxiety? I think the actual study was about the US. The US, 90% yes. of the US set claims that they have anxiety yes. on some level, right? Yes, exactly. And what does anxiety, 
do for us when we don't have attacks coming our way? Like if we're constantly in a state of anxiety, yeah. what does it do to the brain? Yeah. And what does it do to our immune system and to our body and our yeah. emotions? Yeah. So that's a great question. The answer is uh, long-term anxiety will have terrible effects on all of the physiological systems that, it, uh, that are being activated. So what's happening when you have a stress response? Your heart rate is going up, your respiration is going up. So long-term effects of anxiety and stress are um, heart disease. Really? Um, the other thing that's happening when uh, you're in a constant um, state of stress is that blood is being shunted from your digestive and reproductive systems to your muscles because you're supposed to be running away from the lion and you're sitting there worrying about your taxes instead or whatever, the Delta variant instead. And so long-term effects, um, ulcers, reproductive problems, long-term reproductive problems with, with um, long-term wow. anxiety. And that's just the body. So now we get to my favorite body area, the brain. Yes. And so long-term stress will literally start to first kill off the uh, dendrites of your neurons, the, the, the input structures of your brain cells in two key brain areas, the hippocampus, mm -hmm. critical for long-term memory in the temporal lobe, and the prefrontal cortex, critical for decision-making, mm. focus and attention. Mm. And so, for example, PTSD, if you have PTSD, classic example of long-term stress, your whole temporal lobe gets smaller. Mm. Why? Because you first to start to degrade the, the size of your individual brain cells, and then you start to kill them off. And so that is not memory problems ensue. Um, wow. So it so is, is not is, good. Is long-term also the same as chronic? Is that yes. So long-term yeah. stress, long-term anxiety is chronic anxiety yes. and stress. Exactly. Which, which, what's the, the definition of chronic? Does that just mean something that's consistent over a over of time? months, yeah. over months and and years, okay. and um, and of course there's different levels of intensity. Also, I should say that this book, Good Anxiety, is not addressing clinical anxiety. That is a different animal. Mm -hmm. um, for clinical anxiety, just as you would do if you had a broken leg, yes. you need medical treatment. Yes. This is not a medical treatment for somebody that has chronic anxiety. Yes. This is the 90% of people that say, yeah, I have some anxiety every day. I call it everyday anxiety. Every day anxiety. So these are some of the approaches and mindsets that you can use to start to shift that negative effect of anxiety and shift it in to the basic brain activation that it is and start to help motivate yourself to um, address the things anxiety. that you're uh, afraid of. What are, the, what are the common things that most people have on a daily anxiety basis, I guess? What is it? Fear of what? You know, uh, generally, and this is before the pandemic, yes, um, right. fear of public speaking is uh -huh. one of the most common um, uh, fear of uh, money fears, another big one. I'm just thinking about all the my own anxieties that I talked <laughs> about in the book. Let's see. Sure. Yeah. Uh, um, early on, um, social anxiety mm -hmm. is you know they mirror the the clinical levels of uh, anxiety. Okay. One is general anxiety disorder. Is just kind of life and situations and interacting with anything uh, come to my uh, um, start to produce anxiety, yeah. social anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorders, one can start to worry obsessively about whatever that thing is that, that worries you. Um, and of course, the thing uh, that is on everybody's mind right now is the uncertainty around the coronavirus mm -hmm. and everything that's happening in the future. We can't predict. We don't know what's going to happen in the fall with schools um, um, or work. Uh, for that matter. Mm -hmm. And that uncertainty is the key um, driver for a lot of anxiety. So uncertainty in general yes. is, is uncertainty about my money, uncertainty if I go to this social event, am I, you know, I going to fit in? It's yes. just kind of the uncertainty of life yes. around different topics. Yes. It's uncertainty about my parents. Are they going to stay healthy? Yeah. It's just the uncertainty of life. Yeah. So that sounds like it's one of the main causes of daily, everyday anxiety. Yes, right? absolutely. How do we get comfortable with uncertainty so it doesn't consume us? Yeah, that's a great question. How do we embrace it and enjoy uncertainty mm -hmm. yeah. and, and have fun and play and connect with it in a different relationship? Yeah, yeah. So that is a great question. And the answer that I provide in the book is um, 
a multi-spoked kind of strategy. And um, one strategy that's easy to understand is how do you create more joy in mm -hmm. your life to kind of counteract yes. all of these negative that's things so coming, coming out? And so one of my favorite, um, this is in the toolbox part of the book where I go through immediate, medium-term and long-term tools that you can use to mm -hmm. flip your anxiety from bad to good. And my favorite, one of my favorite ones is called joy conditioning. Mm. Joy conditioning is mining your own memory banks mm. for those joyous, funny, pick your favorite positive emotion events in your life and consciously bringing them back up and revivifying them and bringing up those emotions. And my little trick for that is uh -huh. try and find a memory that you love that has an olfactory component to it. A what component? Olfactory. So a particular smell oh. associated with it. Why? Because smells mm. are really evocative of memories. It's very easy to uh, bring up everything associated with that memory if it has a smell. It's okay if it doesn't, but the one that I use is, um, I, I love this one because everybody might have an example of this. I remember a particular yoga class I went to in New York City, and I was doing so well. I was, you know, up dog, down dog. I flipped yeah. my dog. It's like, yeah, I did really well. And then I was doing my the the the, the pose that I do the best, which is Shavasana. So I was in Shavasana, is feeling that the really one where good. You just lay down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I do that really well. <laughs> you just lay on your back, and you're exactly. like child's pose. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I you know I do that even better than child's yeah. pose. It's like I just lay on my back, just Shavasana. And I was feeling really good about myself, had this great class. And then on top of all of that, the teacher came around and she put some lavender lotion on her mm, hand and she it, yes. waved it under my nose. And she gave me the most luscious five second neck massage oh. that I've ever had in my life. Cause you know, I, I, I worked out hard, I was feeling really good about myself. And so I literally, in my purse out there, is a little vial of lavender essence. And when I need a little pick-me-up of, remember the time mm. I just felt so good. It was just this relaxing, feel-good moment. I smell that lavender and that memory, that is my joy conditioning. I'm joy conditioning myself with that memory. But you can do that with whatever memory you want. Joy conditioning. Joy conditioning. Is that a scientific term or is that, that something is that's... That is Wendy, Dr. Professor Wendy Suzuki's term and okay. it's based <laughs> on my 25 years of studying how memory works and it. applying all of my knowledge to addressing anxiety. And it's really a direct um, antidote to fear conditioning, which we all uh. experience automatically. So that's uh, my ex my example is um, my apartment in Washington, D.C. was robbed and I walked around the corner. My door was the hmm. only one around the corner. And I still remember walking around the corner and seeing my door um, crowbarred open, hanging open when it was supposed to be locked. It's like, what's happened? And I walked in, which was not the smartest thing. To do. <laughs> Nobody was there. But but Every time I walked around that corner for you months and that. months, I felt that. That so is fear you, conditioning. How do you flip it? So um, that didn't go away. Uh, and, <laughs> you had and, to move. Yeah, yeah, I did have to move. It yeah. went down slowly. But I, you know, um, um, to counteract that with something like joy conditioning is, you know, invite friends over, create wonderful memories, uh, wonderful safe yes. events in that same space. Um, it never went away, and I'll tell you why, because that is a safety mechanism. You don't want to, uh, you know, the brain doesn't allow us to uh, uh, obliterate anything. This isn't like that movie, um, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Yes. So um, uh, it, we can't do that, but we can counteract that very protective mechanism. Actually, I don't want to eliminate that. I want to be wary of areas and situations that were really, really bad for me. I, that is so you don't very, eliminate it. I don't want to eliminate it. What if it's been something traumatic, though, or someone breaking in or a sexual assault against you yeah. or something traumatic? How yeah. do we learn to heal the memory and the, um, the emotion of that fear, of that trauma, yeah. to live with ourselves or to live in the environment of a home that we can't leave yet, or how do we, Yeah, is yeah. it just more joy conditioning? Are there other things? Yeah, so this is where we get to that boundary between 
clinical yes. levels and what this addresses. So gotcha. I, I'm really not addressing, you know, I, I went to Afghanistan. I have, you know, terrible PTSD. This, That's not that. This can help a little bit, but it does not substitute for you need to go to a therapist, medical profession, yes. yeah, a therapist. And um, Absolutely. so, yeah, I, that, that is not a substitute. However, you can use these in Absolutely. addition to your, Absolutely. you know, uh, therapy uh, uh, approaches. Any tool, I think, is a good tool to try. Yes, Any exactly. tool is a good tool to try. What's another tool we can use in yeah. order to quiet some of the, the negative anxiety that keeps us from joy, that keeps us from feeling good about ourselves? Yeah. What's another tool you like? Yeah. Um, I mean, we already said this, but I think this is one that so many people can use. And it was really inspired by uh, a really good lawyer that I happened to meet at a party one day. And I told her, I'm writing this book about anxiety. And she said, I am the lawyer that I am today because of my anxiety. And I said, oh, tell me about that. <laughs> and she said, you know, I use my anxiety for all the different arguments that the other side uh -huh. is going to put up against me or all the things the judge might say, that becomes my to-do list. Like what if the judge says that? What if the other side brings this up, that, that up? And I turn that into actionable items. And so because I do that on a systematic basis, and I've gotten really good at that, I, I plug all the holes in my case. And I think you could apply that to anything, mm. anything in your life. And I love it because it is an act of, of turning the energy of just worrying, oh, what if this, what if this, into an action. That is really at the core of this book. Can you turn that inner turmoil into an action that is positive? Right. And this is one example that's easy to understand how I do that. Even if you get to the top three things on your list and do something about mm -hmm. that, there is a satisfaction that comes from that. And um, it, you can feel that anxiety uh, uh, coming down with every um, check mark that it, you do. Yeah, and if people don't turn their anxiety anxiety into a positive action, what happens? If they stay in it yeah. consistently, what happens? Well, then we go back to what are the chronic effects of anxiety. They get sick, anxiety. heart disease, long-term stress. Yeah, right. And they stay in this, in this negative emotional state. They stay in the state of pure worry, no action. And mm -hmm. that is... Um, that is difficult to uh, maintain, and, and and it starts to interfere. It's exhausting. It's exhausting. It's got to be dr emotionally draining to be Absolutely. in a constant state of stress, anxiety, and worry. Yes, it draining. is. Draining. It's got to make you look older. Yeah. Feel mm -hmm. tired. I mean, I'm assuming. I'm not sure what the research says about longevity. If someone has a lot of stress and worry and anxiety, but I'm assuming you don't live long. Yeah. Yeah. You probably die younger than you should. Yes. What is, have you studied anything about the blue zones, mm. about the people that live in the blue zones yeah. who live the longest in yes. the world, about yeah. how they manage anxiety or if they have anxiety? Yeah. And is there some benefit to having some anxiety or is it better to just have this kind of worry-free yeah. life? Yeah. Happy-go-lucky, I'm not gonna let anything bother me, I forgive everyone, you know, it doesn't <laughs> matter what you do, I'm just a happy human being. Yeah. Is there some benefit to that or no? Yeah, so I think that, um, I think about anxiety now and all that worry and anger and all these other things that come with anxiety. I really think of it as kind of the wind in my sails. That is the little fire under my backside that gets me to do things, gets me excited, gets, gets me to, go towards the fear and get through it because I know there's something good on the yes. other side. And without it, I mean, that that is, um, I think there's certain perhaps times in your life if you are uh, retired and, and, you know, aren't in this situation where you're dealing with the world, that that could be great. That is the, you know, the happy-go-lucky, no, no worries. But for most of us, I think it is very beneficial to learn how to take that fear that is depleting us, it is exhausting us, it's making us look older, and turn that into something that makes you feel better about yourself. Yes. It decreases the overall stress in your life. And frankly, it is more practical 
to say, look, I, uh, I'm not going to be happy-go-lucky all the time. Nobody's happy-go-lucky all the time. I'm go- but I'm going to use that bad stuff mm-hmm. that, that is inevitably going to come in. And I am going to learn from it. I'm going to use it to my best advantage. And um, one thing we haven't talked about yet, I'm going to learn about myself through, through thinking about my anxiety rather than just trying to say, oh, I hate it, go, go away. What does it tell us about mm. ourselves? And uh, like for me, my social anxiety told me how much I love and I appreciate deep friendships mm. because I didn't have them because I was too scared <laughs> to start really? them. Really? You were so shy. I was so shy and it kept me isolated. And there's something wrong about that. I mean, that... that contributed to the isolation in the first place. And so the realization, Mm. and because part of the time it's like, I'm a lone wolf, I like being alone, you know, it's okay. But actually the truth was, I love being with people. It it motivates me. So I, I had to get through that shyness to get that joy on the other side. And so that was a learning that that I Mm -hmm. went through. Our problem is that in this day and time, there's not a lot of lines coming at us, but there's all the worry that we see every single day when we look in the newspaper and look at our Instagram feeds. And that worry of a possible terrible thing that might happen, that also activates our stress and anxiety.